Deirdre Mulligan. I'm uh, on the faculty here at the School of Information. And uh, we are on behalf of the Algorithms, Opacity, and Fairness Working Group, um, which I co-chair with uh, Jenna Burrell, also a faculty member here. It's a real honor to have John Kleinberg, who is the Tisch University professor in the Department of Computer Science and Information Science at Cornell. Um, talk to us about inherent trade-offs in algorithmic fairness. Um, I think many of you know that John has been a leader um, in many fields, um, but he has uh, recently been doing really important work in this area, and we're just delighted to have him here. So come on up. All right, thanks. All right, thanks. Thank you. Um, So let's see, is the uh, microphone working? Let's see if we, uh, there we go. Seems to be working, good. Um, yeah, well, well, thanks very much for, uh, for the in invitation to come speak here. It's uh, a pleasure to get to uh, take part in the, in the activities that your, your group is doing and to get to sort of talk to people whose uh, work I admire a lot. Um, I want to, talk about some of the work we've been doing on some of the definitional is issues in, inherent in uh, fairness, thinking about some of the ways in which we can measure fairness, define it, and actually look at sort of conflicts among these uh, definitions. And so um, this was inspired by some, initially by some em empirical work that we were doing on uh, judges making decisions about bail uh, in the criminal justice system. But the work I'll be talking about here is actually when we sort of try to delve into some of the definitional aspects of it, some of the things that we found, and some of the ways in which I sort of learned some things about bias uh, that I sort of hadn't been expecting that were sort of counterintuitive to me. So this work started uh, quite a while back in, in some joint work that Sendel Malinathan and I were doing, where we were thinking about the role of prediction algorithms. Um, and the fact that pr prediction algorithms have been you know, largely optimized in settings like this one, which is a Netflix recommendation screen, where we have a lot of data about things that you're doing online, and from this historical data, we try to make a prediction about what you will do next. For example, will you like this movie? Um, right, decisions where we could make billions of them, each one individually not very consequential. Maybe collectively they might actually be consequential. Uh, but something where we have a lot of data that make these very lightweight decisions. But what's interesting, of course, is that you know, similar kinds of predictions were in parallel happening in the offline world, right? So when you submit a resume to a potential employer and they make a decision about hiring you for a job, something syntactically similar is happening, right? Here, you know, you're someone who watches movies. The system doesn't really know you. All they know is some representation of you. Uh, and based on that representation of you, based on your past history, they're making a prediction. Similarly, this employer does not know you. They know some representation of you, and based on that, they're making some prediction about the decision on hiring you, right? Similar for college applications, where you know, from you, the individual, you're creating some intermediate representation that gets acted on. Many, many things sort of have this kind of a pipeline, right? Estimating the probability of some person's future outcome via an algorithm. So it could be, are you going to engage with this movie or with this ad? It could be decisions being made at the time of hiring, at the time of college admissions, and so forth, right? The pipeline starting with an individual who at some level is unknowable, um, abstracting them into features, feeding that in, into an algorithm, and the algorithm either makes a binary yes-no prediction, or you know, perhaps more typically it actually puts some kind of a probability on, you know, what is the probability the person will like this ad, what is the probability this person will succeed in college, uh, and so forth. This is not to say that the way these decisions get made is necessarily by executing this pipeline uh, algorithmically. And in some sense, that's the point. Right? The point is that there are domains where this is being almost done purely in an automated way, and other domains where this is really do being done by human experts. And, and the question is some of the tensions between the syntactic similarities that we see and yet the different ways they're carried out. So there are many questions we could ask here, including questions on the right-hand side, like, is the algorithm even predicting the right thing? Uh, questions on the left-hand side, is it using the right features for this task? Uh, and somehow connected to those two, this third question, are the algorithm's decisions fair? Um, 
So we were thinking about this fairness question. Uh, and again, we were motivated uh, initially by some questions in the, 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 the criminal justice system, where the corresponding pro question at a bail hearing, for example, is um, as specified you know, by legal standards around bail, that the judge should be making a prediction, what is the likelihood this person will commit a crime between now and their court appearance, what's probably that they'll return for their court appearance, that those should somehow be first order characteristics that they're trying to estimate uh, at a bail hearing. And so uh, suddenly I began talking to uh, my PhD student, Manish Raghavan, who is also a uh, Berkeley un undergrad alum, uh, who worked with Christos when he was here. Um, and uh, in particular, ar around the time that we started talking about this was summer of 2016, when there was this extremely influential ProPublica article that looked at a risk tool, um, fortunately not one written by us, called Compass, um, which was an algorithm that was being used uh, to assign probabilities of reoffense, um, right? And there are a lot of things that we could say about Compass in particular, um, but I more actually wanted to sort of abstract some of the definitional questions that came out, out of that debate. Right? And so viewed at some abstract level, the basic operation that Compass was doing was assigning a level of risk to each defendant, some kind of a probability of reoffense. Uh, and the argument that ProPublica made very forcefully in 24 point font was that, you know, that there's software that somehow is making these predictions and it's inherently, inherently biased. What did they mean by this? So here were two kind of stylized findings, right? So the actual report was a nice instance of data journalism in that there was a GitHub repository where you could see the data, you could see the code they used. And for that reason, actually, there was a lot of pushback on what they did. There was a lot of criticism of the methodology. Um, you know, some of it justified, some of it less justified. But the point is, certain of their objections somehow survived all of that criticism, at least at a, a definitional level. And one that sort of, was never really rebutted because it fundamentally was there no matter how you looked at the data, was that if, if, if you look at African-American defendants and white defendants in this data set, um, that the African-American defendants who didn't subsequently reoffend had higher average scores than white uh, defendants who, who, do, who didn't reoffend. And since a score is supposed to show something about your estimate of the probability of committing a crime, it's sort of worrisome that here we have these, all these people, none of whom in this first bullet point went on to do anything wrong, uh, and yet one group was getting higher scores than others. Um, I should say, if we go back to the, are we focusing on the right thing, on, on the correct thing on the right hand side, that this sort of inevitably, some of the language here, like it's almost impossible to sort of add all of the nuance we need. So for example, reoffend, we can't know if someone reoffends, we can know if they were arrested, for example, uh, which is not the same thing. And so there's a lot of slippage going on in, in many of these cases. But, Fundamentally, there's something that feels unfair about this. A whole set of people, all of whom did not go on to do anything wrong uh, with different scores. And then there was the converse fact that white defendants who subsequently reoffended had lower average scores. And again, if your score means your level of risk, you know, you would, as a defendant, want to have a low score. Um, and so, again, this seems unfair. Yeah. Right, so you mean, you mean why is it the average that we're, so, right, if we're looking at discriminative power, then that would be, but I guess we, we, we could look at the distributional characteristics. One thing is, if we think about this as a kind of social welfare measure, right, so we, we could say the, the, the score you end up being assigned causes some harm to you. And so we would like to minimize the harm. Now, how should we aggregate the harm across people? Summing might be the most natural way to do that. And so you could think of average as being some here. And so from a social welfare point of view, one group was taking more of a welfare hit than the other one. Um, I guess that, that's one way to think about it. But it definitely is interesting to look at the distributional characteristics also, absolutely. Um, I'll come back to some distributional questions later on, not quite this one, but yeah. Uh, okay, so what to do about this? Well, one thing we could do is actually ask if, the compass tool was getting this wrong, was there something else it was getting right? And uh, the argument that came back, both from people involved in the creation of the tool, but also from crime policy researchers who were, you know, at, at least superficially outside this debate, was that, in fact, compass had been optimized for something else. It had been optimized for something called calibration. Now, calibration also feels like an important thing. So here's how calibration works. So we should think of compass as having, um, Oh, yeah, and apologies, I can't point to both screens simultaneously, but I'll try to, try to balance between these. Um, 
Compass fundamentally was um, classifying uh, individuals into what you, what you call bins according to risk, right? So there's the point 0.1 bin, the point 0.2 bin, the point 0.4 bin. I'm making up numbers just for pedagogical reasons. And um, everybody in this point 0.1 bin was assigned a 10% probability of reoffending, for example. Okay. <clears throat> Their argument, so calibration would mean the following thing. The point 0.1 really means point 0.1. So if I look at all the people who were placed in the point 0.1 bin, 10% of them should go on to reoffend because that's what 10% is supposed to mean. And if you look at all the ones who are in the 20% bin, 20% should go on to reoffend because that's what 20% should mean. Uh, and this was actually true of the compass risk tool, and it was actually true within each group. So if I look just at African American defendants, um, all the ones assigned a score of S reoffended at a rate of S. And I've looked at all the white defendants, all the ones who were assigned a score of S reoffended at a rate of S. Um, and so. Compass's argument and the people who were uh, sort of supporting this argument said, that's the point. S means S, right? You asked us for a score that was going to correctly estimate their probability of reoffense. We did that. We produced a score of S, and an S fraction of those people wanted to reoffend, and that was independent of race. Adding race would not have helped in that, in that measure. Uh, now, you clearly want calibration. Let me just do a quick digression into I mean, calibration sounds good. Um, you could say, well, maybe I don't want a calibrated rule. Um, if you give up calibration, stuff starts going wrong in weird ways. So let me just tell a story about what might happen if you use an uncalibrated rule. So an uncalibrated rule with respect to groups, you know, imagine a sort of hypothetical world in which hospitals are hiring doctors based on a algorithmic prediction of whether they're going to be a great doctor, okay? Um, and what they're gonna do is create bins and then they're just gonna hire everybody who's in the highest bin. Hopefully the highest bin is higher than 60% because you want people who have a high probability of being great doctors. Suppose they use a rule that's uncalibrated with respect to gender, right? So in aggregate, 60% of the people in that bin go on to be good doctors, but it's not true separately in each gender. Maybe female doctors with this highest score S star are actually more likely to be good doctors than male doctors with the score S star. That's what it would mean to be uncalibrated. Well then, the problem is, I'm now encouraging patients to actually select their doctors in part based on gender because I've told them, on average, the female doctors we hire are better than the male doctors we hire. And that's going to happen as soon as you use a rule that's uncalibrated with respect to two groups. You're telling people that they should now use group membership as part of their evaluation criteria. Calibration takes that out of it. Okay, so it's good we have calibration, but we still have this problem. And so the question is, you know, could we achieve all the desired properties at once? And, and again, since um, Sendel and I were sort of thinking about our own kind of questions around risk tools, it seemed important to understand these kinds of questions. And so uh, with Manish, we worked out a model for what was going on so we could at least ask the question precisely. So here is kind of the ingredients of what's happening in this story. Individuals have two attributes of interest for our purposes. One is they're either positive instances or negative instances. They will go on to commit a crime, they won't go on to commit a crime. Um, and they belong to one of two groups, A or B the two groups of interest across which I might want to calibrate or balance or so forth. Um, they have some features, but that all happens in, inside this sort of black box that I'm not going to open up. But then the risk score is simply a function mapping their features to one of these bins. And if you go into bin B, you get a score of V sub B, which is your risk level, right? Roughly or probably of, of committing a crime. Phrased in these terms, here are the properties that we've been arguing about so far. So calibration means that for each group, uh, A or B, uh, and if I look into each bin B, a V sub B fraction of the people in bin B are positive. Right, that's what the score of V sub B should mean. And what ProPublica was asking was that we should have some notion of balance across the two classes. That if I look at all the positive members of group A, everyone who goes on to commit a crime in group A, the average score should equal the average score of the positive members in group B. Right, so take everyone who goes on to commit a crime in groups A and B, they should have the same average score. And I also want balance for the negative class. Right? The average score should be the same as well. Okay, and so fundamentally, the question is, um, the compass tool, you know, approximately satisfied this, was far from satisfying these two. Um, ideally, we'd like a tool that satisfies all of them. Now, could we achieve all of them? Well, there are some cases where we could achieve all of them. So for example, um, we could show that if I have perfect prediction, maybe somewhere in there is a feature that actually deterministically tells me if they're going to commit a crime in the future. Then I can actually just use that feature. I can assign a score of zero different in the negative class, a one different in the positive class. 
you have to actually think about it a, l a little bit, but it is the case that you would then satisfy all these properties. You would be calibrated, one means one and zero means zero. The positive class would have an average of one in every group, negative class average of zero. Um, that's not really going to happen, but at least that is a case where you could achieve all these. Second, um, more reasonably, if we had equal base rates across the group, if the two groups had the same fraction of positive instances, um, at minimum, I could simply say, say that fraction is 30%. I could just assign 0.3 to absolutely everybody in the entire population. Now, if you notice, that's calibrated, because 30% of those people in every group go on to reoffend. That's where the equal base rates is crucial. 30% of people in group A go on to reoffend, and 30% of people in group B go on to reoffend. Um, and it would be balanced because everyone gets 30%, so certainly the averages are equal. It may not be a very useful risk rule. I mean, I could, I don't need an algorithm to output 30% for everybody. Um, but I would at least achieve it in that case also. Okay, so at least I have these two boundary cases where I can start from. Um, but the interesting fact is that uh, this plan comes to an end there. So. The theorem that we can prove is that in any instance of risk score assignment, if you can achieve all three properties, you must either have perfect prediction or e equal base rates. Those are the only two ways in which you can actually achieve all three of these, right? They're in some kind of inherent tension, so that they're only mutually satisfiable uh, in, those, in those situations. Um, the equal base rates case, of course, you know, you might be able to do something more interesting th than this one. This is simply saying this is one risk rule that would work there. Uh, we don't know about these. So, this was not actually, right, we were a, b a bit surprised initially to, to find this. Um, there are a few things that we should notice. One is, this is not really a theorem about the power of algorithms. It's also not really a theorem about our ability to make inferences from data. It's really just a statement about, we have some numbers and we would like certain averages to all come out to be equal, uh, and we can't get that to happen. And so as a result, it's really about any decision procedure that's in the business of taking individuals and assigning numbers to them, okay? Um, that also means it's sort of hard to make it go away. And when you think about why it's there in the first place, really what's happening, because we can sort of strike the perfect prediction. It's a statement about algorithms only insofar as we believe you can't achieve perfect prediction, right? So if we're outside the world of perfect prediction, um, it basically says once you don't have equal base rates, there is some fundamental imbalance in the population that you can't make go away by clever reworking of your definitions, right? That, that fundamental gap is going to show up somewhere. You can have it show up in the failure of calibration, you can have it show up in the failure of balance, but you sort of have to put it somewhere. Um, I'll say more about that in, in a couple of slides. So we, uh, ar around the same time actually a number of groups were thinking about these sorts of questions. Um, uh, in the end actually it was, sort of a half year later, ProPublica Pro came back and sort of talked to all of us and tried to sort of pull together all of these, uh, all of these new results that their report in the uh, previous summer had, had stimulated. Um, to mention a few of these, so some nice work by, by uh, Alex Juldakova at uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, and uh, similar work by a group at, at uh, Stanford um, looked at similar questions where instead of assigning probabilities as Compass was doing, we just think about saying yes, no, right? So you, you could say I'm gonna take an instance, I'm just gonna say yes or no, risky or not. Um, and then rather than looking at averages of scores, we would look at false positive rates and false negative rates and you get similar uh, negative results there. Um, similarly, around the same time, uh, some very nice work of Moritz Hart, uh, Eric Price and Nadi Shrebro looked at what happens if I take the equalization of false positives and false negatives as an optimization problem in itself. I don't worry about calibration. I just say I would like to equalize averages. That's now a constraint. And now I try to do as well as I can subject to that, 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 that condition. That now gives you some space within which to optimize because it is a, those without calibration are indeed achievable. Um, and then we went back to, that, to, to, to this more recently and looked at are there other configurations which we can achieve, right? So I can equalize false positives and false negatives if I don't care about calibration. Similarly, fundamentally, if I care about calibration, I can basically satisfy one linear constraint on the false positives, on, on the averages and the positives and negatives classes. It's somehow when I try to satisfy two that in general I can't make that happen. Um, let me, uh, just spend 
a couple slides on uh, sort of a sketch of the proof of this fact, because the structure of the proof is not, in the end, that, that, that complicated. Um, so here's how I think about, I mean, I, I, here's how I think about what's going on in the proof. I, actually, if you want something to watch for here, um, the proof is not complicated, yet somewhere it's gonna have to identify these two cases. Because the theorem does not say you can never do it. The theorem says you can only do it in these two cases. So anything that's proving this is gonna somehow, and this is kind of a, sort of a zero dimensional condition. It says there's a point at which things succeed. And there's like a one dimensional condition which says there's a line along which, right, there's an equality, line of equality along which things succeed. So somewhere the proof's gonna have to kind of have a point and a line where things work and everywhere else it doesn't work. So something to watch for here. So well, let me just sketch this. So let's say in group T, N sub T is the number of people and K sub T is the expected number of people in the positive class who will go on to commit crimes. Now. What calibration really tells you is that if I look at some bin B, um, so this bin has 10 people. One of them goes on to commit a crime. Similarly, it has 10 people and the average score is 0.1, so the total score handed out here is one. If I go to this one, this bin of 0.2 with 10 people, two go on to commit a crime, 10 scores of 0.2 is equal to two. Fundamentally, what calibration is doing is saying the total score handed out in this bin is equal to the number of people in that bin who go on to commit a crime. That's what calibration says. Okay, so sums of scores are equal to the actual outcome. That's gonna be useful because sums of scores are what these equalized averages are all about. Um, okay, uh, good, and of course if I add up over all bins, the total score handed out to a group is equal to the expected number who go on to commit a crime. That already says there's gonna be some sort of trouble here, right? So let's imagine X is the average of a person in the negative class, Y is the average score of a person in the positive class. Well. The key is that's independent of which group we're talking about because we have to equalize the average. Right? So there's a universal constant X, which is the average score of someone who doesn't commit a crime, and some presumably higher Y, which is the score of someone who does commit a crime. So, all right, we know that the total score in group T, well, one way to do that is to say all of the people who don't commit a crime get an average score of X, all the people who do get a crime, commit a crime, get an average score of Y. I add that up and I get the total score handed out, which is K sub T. Um, and when I rearrange that, I get an equation in X and Y, right? X and Y are sort of the two unknown things. What are the average scores I'm gonna hand out? And that defines a line. Now, each of these lines has some slope determined by K sub T relative to this. This is the rate of crime in that group. So what does that tell me? Well, if these two are the same, if K sub A equals K sub B, or relative to N, N sub A equals N sub B, then we have equal base rates. These two lines are the same thing and I can actually satisfy this. But if these are different, then I have two lines with different slopes and then they're gonna generically meet in only one point and that point is zero, one. When I give a score of zero to everyone in the negative class and one to everyone in the positive class and that's the point that we end up with, okay? So either the base rates are the same and then there's a whole line along which this works out but if not, then they only meet at perfect prediction. And fundamentally that's what's happening. And Actually, with this proof, you can sort of extend it to say, even if I wanted to only satisfy these things approximately, for example, right? So I would like things to be almost calibrated. I'd like the average to be almost the same. Then everything here gets kind of thickened because now I have some room error. But what it fundamentally says is that you're gonna either, eat, either need to have approximately perfect prediction, the lines are gonna cross somewhere around up here, or approximately equal base rates, meaning the slopes are almost the same. So it's not something I can really make go away by uh, by approximation either. Again, fundamentally what it's saying is this difference in base rates means there's gonna be some, uh, some uh, unfairness somewhere, or conversely, if you want to attack the root of the problem, you should attack the fact that there are different base rates in these populations, that that's somehow where, where the problem began. Okay, so we had this, um, and we were thinking about other domains in which we put probability estimates on people and make predictions about the future. Um, and we we're sort of intrigued by the fact that, you know, purely reasoning from the models, we we're actually able to learn certain things about, you know, what was doable or not doable uh, in this realm of biased, uh, biased decision making. So Manish and I started thinking about other settings where you could look at algorithmic uh, predictions. And one is cases where what you're evaluating is actually sets, not individuals, right? So far, 
what's been interesting here is that, yes, there are groups, yes, we're looking at averages, but fundamentally what's been happening is we look at a single individual, we evaluate them, we assign a score to them. And later we audit the whole system by looking at how it did averaging over a group, but what we cared about was the individual. It was really one decision maker with one individual. Um, but there are many cases where we actually are thinking about the group from the very beginning, right? And sort of to kind of situate this in a context we all think about, you know, if I take this headline now from a couple years ago from the Cornell Chronicle that the admitted class of 2019 is the most diverse in Cornell history, um, that's a statement about a group, the admitted class, right? No one individual is the most diverse in Cornell history. You can only say that about a collection of individuals where we measure something about the composition of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of that group. Now, this focus on evaluation of sets as a kind of issue in itself in this uh, realm of fairness and decision making uh, has a lot of its roots in, in, in this very nice work of Scott Page at University of Michigan, who has really spent a lot of time conceptualizing what do we mean by diversity in groups and what are some of the advantages of striving for diverse groups, even from a pure performance uh, point of view. And so we're gonna take some of that view and say, if we just view the question of diversity, not even as an end in itself, but as a, from a, a performance point of view, what, what could we actually learn? So admissions is one example. Um, similarly, lending, right? If, if you think about that um, from a financial point of view, the, the, the question, should I make this investment, really has the answer, it depends what other investments th that you're making, because in, in the end you're evaluating the collection, uh, and, and there's a lot of work on that. And similarly, selection of teams uh, has similar things. The point is it gets challenging if I'm trying to sort of use an individual score and trying to achieve uh, a group objective. Okay, so we were thinking about this uh, question of diversity, um, and we started from the following point. So let's consider the following conceptual model and see where it gets us. So we have some large pool of applicants. Again, they're divided into groups. Um, I'll call the groups X and Y in this case. Um, and I would like to, out of this group, choose some short list of K people. And actually, our motivation here was, say, a hiring context, um, say, an academic hiring context. Where we get many job applicants. We would like to interview a subset of them. Okay. Um, and the concern is that maybe there is implicit bias operating in the decision-making procedure so that the evaluation of candidates is being biased, either explicitly or implicitly, against, say, group X. Okay. So group X and group Y both apply, but somehow the candidates from group X, I'm somehow downweighting uh, for some reason that we're gonna take as sort of just given within the model. Okay. What should we do about that? So one increasingly popular intervention is this thing called the Rooney Rule. Um, the Rooney Rule is something many of you may recognize from your own experience recruiting, which is that you commit up front that in your short list of K, you're going to commit to include at least one candidate from group X, what I'll call an X candidate. Okay. That's all, it's just a promise to do that. Um, the term Rooney Rule is named after Dan Rooney, the owner of the Pittsburgh Steelers in 2002, who headed a NFL commission on diversity, which actually proposed this as a rule for recruiting head coaches in the NFL. And that was really the first place where it was somehow institutionally formalized and carried out, you know, really uh, deliberately. They were doing this through a combination of concern over the very low representation of mi minority head coaches and also an impending class action lawsuit that they were hoping to head off by implementing this rule. Um, there have been a number of interesting law review articles, you know, suggesting that this is a, an interesting sort of interpolation between something that would be, you know, much more forceful, like you must commit to actually hire uh, someone from Group X, and something which is just sort of has the strength of just a kind of voluntary opt-in guideline that no one's bound by, right? It's, you're, you, you're sort of creating a binding commitment at the level of information gathering. You're gonna search for this person, uh, even if you're not here. Um, it's become sort of popular in other dom domains. Uh, Barack Obama in 2015 exhorted the tech industry to use this for executive hiring. Um, a commission chaired by Eric Holder uh, to review uh, 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 practices at Uber in 2017 also recommended using the, the Rooney Rule. So a rule is very simple in its statement, uh, but as we'll see, sort of intriguingly complicated to think about what it actually implies. Um, okay, there are a lot of aspects to it. Um, 
there's the temporal effect. So this is actually a, a nice paper by Cynthia Dubois who did this difference and difference estimate uh, for the effect of, of the Rooney Rule, right? This is when the Rooney Rule began. This was the uh, number of uh, head coaches uh, who were from minority groups. And comparing to other, and, uh, other hiring in the football domain, so offensive coordinators, defensive coordinators, and NCAA football head coaches, Division I head coaches, who none of whose hiring was bound by the Rooney Rule. And you can actually, as she argues in this paper, the difference there actually is, is significant. It seems to actually happen right at the time this was introduced. Okay, so there are, there are a lot of interesting aspects to this, but we were intrigued by sort of a question in, 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 in the genre that, that Scott Page often asks, which is, what are, the, are, there, are there pure performance benefits to introducing something like the Rooney Rule? Say I care about the quality of all the candidates that I see on my short list, because one of the arguments about the Rooney Rule is that when you bring in, as is true in faculty hiring too, if you a bunch of people to interview, even the ones who don't get the job have actually benefited through simply sort of increased exposure to a whole bunch of people who later will be doing recruiting in other domains and for other reasons. And so we should really think about benefiting all K people who, who we interview. It's really not simply a search designed to arrive at, at one outcome. So if, if we're thinking about that, could it be that we're actually making better decisions uh, because of this? So what would be the argument for why we might be making actually better decisions because we're committing to an interview uh, someone from a minority group. Well, if it's the case that I'm implicitly biased against minority candidates, against candidates from group X, then when I see them, I'm somehow downweighting my, est you know, my estimate of their future performance is being downweighted. Uh, and so as a result, my unconstrained search is actually overlooking people who actually might actually be better. By forcing myself to look at them, that may be improving things. So let me suggest a model where this actually happens, okay? And I'm gonna try arguing that under some relatively reasonable set of assumptions, uh, you can actually find cases where constraining your behavior in this way is actually going to improve the outcome. So here's the model. It has basically three ingredients. Um, one is that each applicant has some potential for future performance, okay? So each applicant, uh, you know, so if we imagine you know, football head coaches, it might be something about win-loss record or more generally the revenue you generate for the team. If I think about academic hiring, you know, we can think about it's some kind of lifetime future output. Uh, if I'm signing recording artists, it's lifetime music sales or whatever. All of these examples, all of them being from, drawn from creative professions, have the property that they tend to be power law distributed or at least approximately some kind of, a, as in the probability that you're gonna exceed some parameter T is something like t to the minus some exponent, okay? Um, so th this is the first important uh, feature of this model, right? So let's think about ac academic hiring, right? You could ask what fraction of all academics have a Google Scholar citation count of at least 5,000 in their lifetime? What fraction of all academics have a Google Scholar citation count of 10,000, of 20,000, right? Every time I double it, it goes down by two to some power, and that's the exponent on the, uh, on the power law, right? This is important, because if, if, if it were exponentially distributed, you should almost never, ever see high Google Scholar citation counts. But the fact that you do see Google Scholar citation counts in the hundreds of thousands is because it's a heavy tail distribution. It's something which actually decays quite slowly, as it does here, right? That a Google Scholar, you know, having a citation count of 100,000, which is an enormous outlier event, is really only you know, 10 to some power times less likely than 10,000, which you actually see with some, some regularity. Okay, um, qualitatively what that means is we're hiring in a domain where superstars exist, right? And that's gonna be important because you know, the pushback on the Rooney Rule ha is sometimes you're constraining me, you're preventing me from interviewing this person, but they might be a superstar, and so we're allowing for that possibility. Okay, so that's the future potential of each applicant. Now, people apply from groups X and Y, and I can tell who belongs to X and who belongs to Y. And um, it's not the same number of candidates. So N candidates come from group Y, again, that's kind of the majority group, uh, and then minority group alpha N come from group X. So alpha is the next parameter we wanna think about. That's the relative frequency of people in the minority group. That number could be bigger than one, could be less than one. I mean, if you want a sort of default thing to think about, think of it as less than one, 
because uh, they're in the minority. They might be rarer. Um, I'm going to make an assumption that uh, certainly we could go back and revisit that they're all drawn from this power law distribution, right? There isn't actually a difference between the two groups. It's only your own potential biased decision making that imposes a difference. Um, and, and again, uh, we come back to that. Okay. Um, so that, I mean, why might we think there is a difference? Well, these people, even after you hire them, are going to still continue their careers in a biased world. And so it's not clear, you know, that that wouldn't happen. Um, power laws actually turn out to be a regime in which the most interesting thing happens. So we have results for all the different ranges, but somehow the, the most interesting thing happens. And somehow the crossover between wanting to use the Rooney rule and not wanting to use the Rooney rule is going to sort of happen during the power law regime. So, but yeah, but the, the results hold for, for anything. Yeah. Um, and then the third thing, I haven't introduced bias yet. So let's talk about bias. Again, because I want a very simple model to start drawing conclusions from, uh, here's a extremely simple uh, definition of uh, bias, which is that there's some parameter beta greater than one, so that when a selection committee looks at a given X candidate who has a true potential of XI, they think of their potential as XI divided by beta. Right? So it's simply div divide down. Again, this multiplicative form is sort of where the most interesting things happen. There's also been interesting, uh, a bunch of interesting recent work in the social psychology of implicit bias. So some work of Van Ross and Vold, for example, where you actually ask, you know, you, you run these experiments where you ask people to evaluate CVs and then you actually compare it to the actual citation counts, for example. And there does seem to be this kind of multiplicative difference that, that persists across, across ranges. So we'll use this multiplicative functional form. Okay, so schematically, candidates get drawn from this distribution, which is heavy tailed, representing this kind of creative output. Uh, there are more Y candidates than X candidates. The X candidates get scaled down by one over beta because of bias. You sort and you pick the top K. And that's the process. Question about the process? And I sort of want to argue you need like all three of the, well, I certainly need alpha and beta. There's some composition of the two groups and there's some bias. Uh, the power law is sort of what makes this interesting actually, right? The fact that we're in this world where these extreme outliers can actually happen. But that's what's, uh, that's what's, what's going on. So. What's interesting here, so the point is, you know, when k equals three, so say in this particular example, I'm selecting three, uh, the Rooney rule has no force because you actually put this person in third place, so you satisfied the Rooney rule. But had you been trying to pick two, you would not have been allowed to pick these two, you've been required to pick an X candidate. Why might that be a good thing? Well, because maybe this X candidate is actually better than this Y candidate, and the only reason they're in third is because they got scaled down by beta. That's the fundamental tension going on here. On the one hand, right, you're, you're being told you have to move this person up. Um, that may knock out someone who's genuinely better, but it might also actually be moving up somebody who is better and you were simply dividing down because of your either implicit or explicit bias. Um, we can think of this actually as something well known in, in the economic theory community, uh, the problem of delegation, um, which actually dates back to uh, the Nobel laureate Banks Holstrom's PhD thesis, which sort of defined the problem of delegation. Delegation is a kind of mechanism design, but where mechanism design has a very expressive vocabulary, right? It can offer payments and incentives of all sorts. Delegation says there's a principal trying to exercise control over an agent who has their own self-interest, but all the principal can do is refuse to accept certain solutions, right? They delegate to the agent and say, go do some work, but I'm only going to accept solutions in the following subset. And in that way, they hope to actually achieve better outcomes by constraining the biased agent's behavior. The Rooney Rule is a very simple example of delegation. They say, go out and find the best candidates that you can, but when you come back, I, I need your shortlist to have an X candidate on it. Subject to that, keep in mind, even the biased agent is interested in finding the best X candidate that they can, right? Because the biased agent isn't necessarily interested in finding bad candidates. They simply can't necessarily control their own bias, right? And so you could even think of this as a, as a kind of self-control device in which your sort of first period self is executing delegation over your second period self, right? Your first period self wants to make sure that you don't succumb to this bias. Since you can't directly control it, you commit to interviewing at least one executive. All right, let's start with a version where the utility of the, what we have is actually the sum of the potentials of all the K finalists chosen. Again, you could say that, well, the goal is to only hire one person, but we're taking this more generalized view that has motivated a lot of the work around the Rooney Rule, which is that 
everybody benefits from being interviewed. Um, okay. So what is the question? We have three, fundamentally three parameters. We like to ask, is it a good idea to use this thing or is it not a good idea? Um, and again, the fundamental tension is you're elevating somebody who might just be worse. After all, the data says they're worse, but might only be worse because of the bias. And so the main result is for every size of the, of the short list, characterizing the choices of alpha, which is the composition of the pool, how many exigents there are, beta, the level of bias, and delta, the power law exponent, for which the Rooney rule actually produces a positive change in expectation. Um, and so to uh, say that in more mathematical terms, for every constant k around two, there's some explicit function phi sub k, so that it actually produces uh, improved utility expectation if and only this function evaluates to a quantity greater than one. Um, I actually initially had, so for k equals two, we actually at least can write down the formula, which is actually quite elaborate, which came as a, a bit of a surprise to us because you see the whole model, right? This is the entire model. There isn't anything particularly complicated in it, and the Rooney rule has a very simple specification. Um, but actually, maybe more useful to, to convey some description of this is, well, let's think about k equals two, right? So I have to pick two candidates. Is it beneficial to force me to have one of them come from group X? Right, that's, that's, that's the question. Um, what are the choices of, so for every choice of alpha and delta, so for every choice of minority fraction and power law exponent, there's some bias beta beyond which I should be using the Rooney rule, right? Because the more biased I get, the more we need to impose the Rooney rule. If I'm very, very biased, then we somehow really need to impose it. If I were not biased at all, if beta were one, we clearly would never want to use it because I'm actually making correct decisions. So for every, so you can imagine a kind of surface in space, right? Down here in the plane is alpha and delta. And for every alpha and delta, there's some beta at which I should start using the Rooney rule. And the question is, what does that surface look like in this model, right? Everyone see what the surface is supposed to, yeah. So that's what the surface looks like. It's actually surprisingly complicated looking. Um, so it does a few things you would expect. So alpha goes back in this direction. So as we go in this direction, fewer and smaller and smaller fraction of minority applicants. Now if I have fewer and fewer minority applicants, I should need to have more and more bias to need, because there's a small fraction of many, so even just the chance that without bias, they're one of the top, right? If I'm only hiring two people and only 10% of my candidate pool is from a minority group, then even just, you know, with no bias, it's not that likely that they're actually going to be. So I need more and more bias for this to be, to be worth it. Um, k two. Here k equals two for the surface. Yeah, the surfaces for k equals three and higher get even more, slightly more weird looking. Um, in this, the direction in terms of delta is interesting. So as I head toward delta equals zero, the world of power laws with low exponent are, is a world in which you have these extreme outliers. Right? You have people who just are just way off scale. Um, and strange things start happening there, as I'll show in a couple slides. So some things to notice, it sort of ramps up here because um, intuitively, why do I need more bias? Because when there are extreme outliers, kicking somebody out of a top spot is a little worrisome because they might just be way out beyond everybody else. And so you're a little hesitant to do that. Having said that, that intuition can't be the whole thing because we have these weird non-monotonicities also, right? I can actually find choices of uh, alpha where as I vary delta, I go from not wanting to use the Rooney rule to wanting to use it to not wanting to use it again. So there's certain weird non-monotonicities. Okay, so a couple things to explain. The first is, the, is actually this, this cliff here, right? This cliff is actually shooting up to infinity uh, somewhere. Let's try to understand that first. So in particular, I'm gonna try to talk about two things that come out of this picture. So are two things from the model which actually, at least for me, taught me something about biased evaluation that I sort of hadn't fully understood before doing this, uh, which I think sort of makes some sense in retrospect. The first one is this question, something I learned about bias uh, that I hadn't really anticipated. So for which pairs of alpha, minority composition, and delta, power law exponent, does the Rooney rule improve utility as the bias goes to infinity? In other words, again, let's think of k equals two. When should I reserve a slot for an x candidate in the case of infinite bias, right? Suppose I have infinite bias. Uh, does it ever make sense to reserve a slot for the top uh, x candidate? 
Right, so it basically says, when I have infinite bias, I'm looking at X candidates and Y candidates. I can rank within them just fine, but I somehow have absolutely no way to interleave these two lists because I just don't trust myself to correctly merge them, right? My bias is effectively infinite. Um, would I ever want to reserve a slot? Um, and the, the surprising fact is the following. Now, and this is a fact about power laws, basically. No matter how small the fraction of X candidates, there is a small enough power law exponent so that the Rooney rule actually improves ut utility. Okay. So that says even if 5% of my applicant pool comes from the, the minority group, there exists a power law exponent low enough that in fact you should still reserve a slot for them. Um, uh, this functions if, if and only if, in, the, in this particular model, as in this model of decision making completely specifies what's gonna happen, right? Because it says, people are drawn from this, uh, we divide them down by beta, we merge sort them. So it's a completely well-defined process. And we're simply asking, do I have higher expectation if I pick the top two or the top two according to the rooting rule? Oh, for sufficiently large n, yeah. So, yeah, so this is in the, in the limit of, so for sufficiently large n, yeah. So you can think of it as there's some kind of a low order term that's decaying this year. Okay, so that's what this, so you know, I, you know, I think of like, what, right, so what this is saying is suppose we have some, you know, award that we give out to members from group X and group Y, you know, to the union of group X and Y, and we're infinitely biased against group X, and we have the choice to either give out two awards every year unconstrained, which will certainly go to members of group Y, or we can give out an award to one X and one Y uh, constrained, okay. And 20 years later, we're gonna go back and we're gonna look at the lifetime citation counts of all these people. And these citation counts are drawn from some power law with a very, very low exponent, right? And so it's a concrete question. In which world am I going to have a higher, am I gonna be more proud of the awards I gave out, right, when I go and look at the citation count? Um, and the answer is that uh, the, if, the, if the power law has sufficiently low exponent, then even if only, right, 10%, 5%, even if a very, very low percentage of people from group X are in the pool, I should still reserve one slot for them. Yes, so fundamentally, this is what's going on, yeah. So, to kind of answer your question, let's imagine Z star is the maximum of N draws from a power law with exponent one plus delta. So that's the top Y candidate, and nothing I can do about that, right? So if I don't use the Rooney rule, the other candidate will be the second Y candidate because I'm in the world of infinite bias. Um, and you can do a little, so some facts about power laws uh, that you can work out is that the expected value is scaled down by delta over one plus delta. If I use the Rooney rule, the other candidate will be the top X candidate. Then uh, you can do some other work with power laws and discover that the expected value is asymptotically alpha to the one over one plus delta. Now I, I just compare these two, and in fact, it improves utility if and only if alpha is bigger than that quantity. But that means no matter how small alpha is, I can find a delta that actually drops, drops below that. Actually, the reason why we thought this was wrong when we first proved it was we were like, wait, this is crazy. So 20% of your people are from group X. Take the 80% who are from group Y and arbitrarily break them into two groups, 40% called group A and 40% called group B. Now, Okay, so group A and group B are two halves of the X candidates, which are a huge fraction of your applicant pool. The best person in group A is better than the best person in group X in expectation. That's true because there are 40%, of, you know, 40 of these people and only 20 of your group. The best person in group B is also better than the best person in group X because there are 40 of them and 20 of them. So why in the world are you reserving a slot for group X when you have group A and B and they're both more deserving? So that stumped us for a little, like, that felt like a pretty compelling argument. Like, A and B are both more deserving, yet you didn't reserve a slot for A and B, you just reserved a slot for group X, which is wrong. Right, so the question was what's actually wrong with that argument. Um, the point is that when I, the point that when I use the Rooney rule, it's not that I pick one of A or B and pick from there. It's that I'm picking the best of A and B, right? And so, the second person I'm picking is the second best, right? It's not that I pick A, it's not about picking A and X or A and B. That's not what I'm doing. I'm not saying 
slice off half of your ex, uh, 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 of, uh, of your majority candidates, pick from there, and then pick here. It's that I'm picking the best from all of A and B. And so the second person I pick is the second best. So they're conditioned on having already having someone better than them. So what it's really saying is, with these very heavy-tailed distributions, such as we see with lifetime output, simply knowing that somebody is above you puts some kind of absolute cap on the performance. Whereas in X, no matter how small they are, there's no upper bound to how good that person is. Because I have no indication of anybody above them, because I'm in this world of infinite bias. Right? So no matter how small that group is, the top person there is somehow unconstrained. Right? They're all the way out at some distance. Whereas the second best person in this big group from majority class is actually constrained by the top person. Uh, and so, in fact, this, uh, so, so this was one intriguing thing that I somehow hadn't ever fully understood, that if we have these measures of lifetime output, which are so heavy-tailed, the notion of being the top in some even quite small but identifiable group is actually quite a powerful thing. Let me tell you the second thing I learned about bias decision-making that I found kind of surprising. Um, so this is just the case of infinite bias, which is by far the easier case. When I have actual some finite bias, uh, things get much, much more complicated, and that's why you get weird things in this surface, which I won't try to get into here. Let me instead tell you this other interesting thing that we learned. Um, so fundamentally, if we want to do this analysis, this is the basic object that we have to, under, this is the basic probabilistic object you need to reason about in this, which is, um, if you think about two groups, A is the top candidate one, B is the top candidate another, I realize I'm overusing the letters A and B in this, in this dialogue, um, and C is some level of bias, I'm basically asking, how good is candidate A given that they're better than C times candidate B, right? So if in order to get hired from this group, you have to be twice as good as someone from another group, then I'm interested in your expected value conditional on you being twice as good as the person from the other group. Um, and this actually dates all the way back to some of the early empirical work that preceded the, the, the Rooney Rule. Before the Rooney Rule, in fact, the, win, the win-loss records of African-American head coaches was actually higher on average than for coaches generally, um, arguably because they had to pass through this higher filter imposed by some kind of implicit bias. Okay, so this is the basic object we're interested in, right? How good are these people given that they have to be twice as good as these other people? Um, it turns out this is a really messy thing to evaluate. Uh, evaluating the expectation of one random variable conditional on being more than twice some other random variable um, does not behave nicely at all. And to show you that, I'll suggest we think about the following thing. So let's think about, as we increase the bias, what this expectation looks like, okay? So how good should I expect person A is if they had to be better than person B? If they had to be better than twice as good as person B? If they had to be better than three times as good as person B? Right? Think about as I sweep through all the factors I could look at, how good is this person in expectation? Okay. This function turns out to be sort of a mess. And if for, for example, it's hard to even answer questions like, is it at least monotonically increasing in C? I mean, if I have to be three times as good as the competition, presumably I'm better in expectation than if I had to only be twice as good as the competition. So for that, let me suggest the following parable, okay? So suppose there's an academic department. Every year it looks at one theoretical candidate and one applied candidate, and it tends to prefer hiring applied candidates. So it will only hire the theoretical candidate in a given year uh, when the theoretical candidate is twice as, at least twice as good as the applied candidate. Otherwise, it'll hire the applied candidate. Department two also favors applied candidates, but even more so. So it will also look at a theoretical candidate and an applied candidate in its faculty search, and it will only hire the theoretical candidate if the theoretical candidate is three times as good or more. Okay. Now, 20 years later, we look back at the ranks of the theoreticians in these two departments, and we ask, does the second department, which needed a factor of three, have better theoreticians on average than the first department, right? It feels like, obviously, yes, because they had to pass through a higher filter, as in they had to be three times as better as the competition. Um, the answer is actually not necessarily, uh, which, again, surprised us and caused us to have to erase large parts of our proof the first time we discovered it. Um, here's a simple example, okay? Let's imagine that this is what the world looks like. Uh, faculty candidates, can have qualities that are either one, five, nine, or 13, okay? And every year we see a candidate, you know, from group A and a candidate from group B, the theoreticians and the applications people, and they're each drawn uniformly at random from that. Let's look at who the two departments end up hiring. 
So one uses the rule A greater than 2B, which is this blue line here. So they hire a, so out of the 16 possible years that can happen, right, for this way and for that way, they hire a, an A candidate, a theory, theory candidate, in four of those years, right, when you're in one of these four points, right, because uh, this one is, you know, the applied candidate is five, the theory candidate is 13, that's more than twice, so you hire them, and similarly. The one that hires when it's three times as good only hires in these three years, here. Okay, let's, let's work out the average. Um, the first part, which uses the threshold of two, has these four possibilities, and so their average quality of the A candidate they hire is 10. But the one that uses the factor of three, the error average quality is nine. They're actually doing worse. Now, this struck us as kind of baffling, because if you were to see a department that had a higher filter and they had worse people, you would have all sorts of reasons why that might be true, and in real life, that may be why they're true. One, because that department is so unwelcoming, no good person would go there. Or because if they have that higher filter, they must have bad judgment in lots of ways, they probably aren't even good at evaluating these people when they hire them. Those may all be true. But the weird thing is, none of them have to be true. This could happen for purely arithmetical reasons, um, which is sort of an interesting, uh, interesting fact, right? Having a higher filter um, does not, uh, does not necessarily imply anything. Okay, so let me check how much, uh, how much time would you suggest? Should I wrap up in like five minutes or five minutes? All right. Okay, yeah, I'll aim for like, yeah, six, seven minutes. In that case, let me tell you about one last, uh, one last thing we noticed in these, in these models. Um, Let's try to conceptualize what we're doing here. And here we went back to some of Scott Page's work uh, about sort of the diversity of the pool. We have made one really concrete assumption, which is that what we're optimizing here is the sum, right? We're optimizing the sum of the, uh, of the people that we, that we interview. But we could ask about other things we might want to optimize in that group. For example, the max would be a natural thing, right? We have these random variables, we pull them in, we then realize the values and we take the best one because after all, we're interviewing for one hiring position. So, you know, conceptually what we're doing is we're saying we have a universe of applicants, n of them, we want to choose a set T consisting of K of them, and the sort of two interesting things that we're doing, one is we have a way of evaluating the set that we get. So far I've just been using the sum, but I could use something else. And we have a test that we apply to everyone, reducing everybody to a score, and we basically sort by the score, and we then evaluate the set that we get. And let me temporarily take bias out of it. Bias equals one for now. I just want to look at the effect of different ways we could evaluate the set of people that we bring in, right? And Scott Page's argument is that you don't always just want to look at the sum. That's not how you necessarily evaluate teams, right? He tells the story of when he had a job in high school where he was on a landscaping crew and everyone kind of jumped out of a truck and all dug stumps out of the ground so you could then plow the soil. And he's like, basically the number of stumps the team dug out of the ground was the sum of how many stumps each of them could dig per hour because there wasn't a lot of teamwork on stump digging, they just dug them all out. But for other kinds of problem solving, you might want to sort of think about how perspectives combine, how you might take the max value that you get, and so forth. Okay, so if the objective function is the sum, then what we've been talking about so far makes sense. The test I apply to each individual applicant I should be the expectation, and I should choose the K people with the highest score, and that's gonna optimize. But for other things, that may not be what I wanna do. So let's look at what happens if I try to optimize the sum in different contexts. And this is an example that Maitre Raghu and I uh, looked at. So let's go back to sort of the a different view of interviewing in which I'm picking the best, right? So I'm gonna, I have to pick K random variables. At that point, the value gets materialized and I pick the highest of them, okay? That's, that's the idea. I look out at a universe of N random variables with some known distribution. These are the candidates that I have not yet evaluated. I get to pick K of them to look at, and my reward is the maximum, right? I, I, I then materialize those values. How should I do that? Well, here's an argument that you don't always want to pick the sum. So suppose I have K can, I have two K possibilities. K of my candidates are sort of high risk, high re reward. They produce a value of K minus one with probably one over K, and zero otherwise. And the other are completely safe and deterministic. They produce a value of one with probably one, okay? Right, so K of them with low probability, very high value, otherwise zero, K of them are just one. Uh, what I get to do is pick K of these people, learn the values, and I, my reward is the max. So 
if I evaluated them by expectation, I would pick uh, the deterministic ones, because they have an expectation of one. Whereas the other ones are just slightly worse, right? K minus one divided by K, which is less than one. So if I were picking by expectation, I would do that. On the other hand, um, if I were to choose all of the high risk, high reward ones, well, then it's easy to work out that with constant probability, one of them achieves their high value. Because there are K of them, each with a one over K probability of achieving a good value, constant probability one of them will, in which case I'll reap this enormous reward. And so my expected re reward there is huge. So if I'm being judged on the max, I shouldn't just compute everyone's expectation in isolation and just rank them. That would be a bad way to do things. Now the question is, where have things gone wrong? Was the whole idea of applying a numerical test and sorting the problem, or am I just applying the wrong test? Right? And that's sort of the, the key question. It's possible that there's no way to do well on this function by reducing everyone to a single number. Or maybe I'm just reducing them to the wrong number, and I should be finding some other way. And the answer is actually the second, which is sort of the intriguing outcome. It turns out I'm just using the wrong test. Suppose instead I evaluated, right, I'm trying to choose k random variables from each one. I get to collect those, and then we reveal their values, and my reward is the maximum of them. Then it's okay to apply a test to people, but I should be applying the following different test, which is I look at each applicant I, who's represented by a random variable, and I ask, if I were to draw k times independently from their distribution, what is the max that they would do, right? So if this job applicant could live their life k times over independently, what is their best outcome? In other words, sort of what's the upside potential, okay? And then the theorem you can prove is that if I use that as my measure, um, then if I sort based on that, that's, that's that single number, then the k people I select is actually producing a set whose performance is with some constant times the optimal, even if I could actually optimize over everything. Um, right, so it's sort of interesting because, you know, when you think about the notion of we hire based on potential or we admit based on potential, there's actually sort of one definition of what we might mean by that, which is we're asking, if we look at someone and say, what is the best this person is plausibly going to do if we sort of think about sort of K independent scenarios that could play out, we optimize based on, we optimize based on that. Um, and it's sort, of, it's sort of an interesting way to sort of constrain the optimization problem because it says, I wasn't allowed to sort of iteratively optimize, right? If I could have optimized by picking one, materializing their value, reaching out and picking the next one, I might be able to do much smarter things. The constraint I have is that I have to actually look, assign a number to everybody and pull everyone in at once and that's what makes this challenging. Okay, so this is sort of one, one final thing that we, we learned from thinking about this, that sometimes it's the case that you can actually do well by reducing everyone to a single number, but sometimes you have to choose that number carefully, right? It's not just necessarily expected performance, but something more carefully constructed based on the objective you're trying to optimize. All right, so um, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll try to wrap up. So there are a number of definitions of both fairness and also efficiency and optimality that we've been using here. It's been sort of interesting, I think, to think about that you can get some very complex behaviors from relatively syntactically simple interventions. And I think of the Rooney Rule and other kinds of interventions around you know, recruiting processes as a, as a nice instance of some kind of a very lightweight, thin intervention that you can inject into a very complicated system. Um, which can actually lead to some interesting, interesting behaviors. Um, there's also this point that sometimes we think about individuals, but sometimes we're actually evaluating the set that we construct holistically, and some of the reasoning when you construct the set holistically uh, can be quite different. And finally, everything I'm talking about here induces some kind of a dynamics over time, right? We've been talking about a snapshot. This is what happens when we try to apply this definition right now. Um, but many things happen when I start to apply it over time. For one thing, Going forward, um, we have a different composition in the pool. We have different collections of features and labels based on the way I've treated different populations differently. Um, and it, as the economists teach us, as in some citations from actually a, a few slides ago due to Phelps, Arrow, Cote, and Lowry, um, even the effort people will put in is going to be based on how they're being judged. So for example, if you know that the world is biased against you, it's as though there's a tax on your effort. 
because for every quantum of effort you put in, you're getting less than sort of a corresponding unit of return because some of it is lost to the bias. And in that world, you're actually incentivized to put in less effort than the group that doesn't have bias. And so often biases can therefore become self-fulfilling uh, as people rationally put in less effort. And so I think these dynamics that get induced over time lead to some very, very interesting questions uh, that suggest there are going to be a lot of interesting things to think about in the space going forward. Thanks very much. So in your model, the bias beta is some is a problem with the selector. Yeah. Uh, and your interventions are light. Yeah. Is that simply because it's politically palatable to do so? I mean, why not, you know, sort of have a learning algorithm across a particular problem, whether it's recruitment or something, to identify uh, a mean bias and inflate everybody's score by by dictum or you know. Yeah. So. Right, so interesting question, like why not interventions where you say, let's try to learn what the bias is and then actually, um, yeah, so it, it, it's interesting to look at the, and so if you look at the implicit bias literature, for example, right, part of the problem is the difference between sort of ordinal compare, I mean, so, so for starters, yes, those are definitely interesting interventions and certainly education is one, one, one aspect of the interventions that people try. Why would people try something like this? One is the difference between numerical comparison and ordinal comparison, right? So many settings, I'm evaluating people by, do I prefer this person or that person? Um, if I ask people, write down a number, right? Uh, for, for this person, I, I can actually uh, introduce more noise than signal, for example. So yes, if people had a very accurate way of writing down a numerical estimate, um, then I could scale them appropriately. But notice that these interventions work in a model where no one ever writes down a number. All people ever do is compare ordinally. Um, and the model about when you get performance gain is assuming that there are values, and we're looking at whether the expected value goes up or down. But notice that the agents in the system never have to actually work out those values. They're only doing ordinal comparisons, which I, I think implicitly is sort of one, one, one reason why people sort of look at these interventions where you're only uh, into intervening at the, at the level of rank this person above that person rather than making people write down, write down numbers. But it, it's an interesting question. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, and then what I should do is basically say, um, in a way, there's a sort of duality between the team of k and the k independent lives this candidate is going to live. So if I'm trying to pick you know, the average top h out of k, I should say, if this person could live their life k times, how would they do in the h position, basically? Oh, I see. I mean, I'm, then I would need some countervailing cost constraint that, yeah, so you could ask the question like, I get a benefit, but I pay an incremental cost for each extra person I evaluate. Um, not something that we've, that we've looked at. If there were a sort of natural mapping between, like this, you know, for those of you who think about submodular function optimization, there's some kind of submodular function hiding behind here. Um, and so one could try looking at that translation. But what's, of course, different is that the way we're optimizing is this completely weird way in which we have to write down a sort of completely independent, isolated score for each person and then sort by them. So yeah, if there's a cost and I sort of want to maximize reward minus a cost for each person I interview, uh, I don't think we know much about that case. I interesting question. Um, just building on the question about noisy measurements, what if you wanted to instead look at the probability of getting some fraction of the top true top K applicants in the top or something like list decoding. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, right, so if I wanted, right, so the question is like, I could say, is the Rooney rule helping maximize the likelihood that I got the true top K? Um, yeah, so then you, 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 you get somewhat similar results, although somewhat less extreme uh, results than here. So for example, if you think about the infinite bias case then, um, the fact that this, you know, for person from the 20% group who are the minority group X, the fact that they might have this incredibly large value matters less because I'm no longer computing an expectation, I'm just computing the probability that they win. And so you actually, um, it's the set of conditions under which you apply the Rooney rule in your case you can work out is actually a sort of more restricted case. Um, you more want to apply the Rooney rule if you're actually benefiting from the expected value than from just the probability being right. And that's precisely because these tail events tend to, tend to push you toward wanting to apply it. Yeah. 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 So, <clears throat> right, I mean, so we were motivated by, uh, you know, a couple sample domains. So in academic publishing, deltas uh, between one and two, typically. Um, so like some of the earliest work was by Sid, Sid Redner looking at the whole history of uh, the physics literature where he gets something that's kind of like one over t to the three minus epsilon. Actually, cumulative, one over t, t to the two minus epsilon. Um, you get similar results if you look at Web of Science, you look at Archive, for example. Um, then the other is if you imagine sort of creative professions like look at distributions of artists and sort of total record sales, song downloads or things. Uh, again, you get sort of exponents there between like uh, cumulative exponents between zero and one, so density functions between one and two. Yeah. Yeah, so right, because you can get alphas and you can get uh, deltas, you, you could actually ask what point in the space we're at. Um, yeah, I think my, the, the biggest question there, of course, is, is again, this um, assumption, which I think certainly makes it cleaner here, but, you know, it's interesting to revisit, that you're still hiring people into a world that will continue to be biased even after you hire them. And so there's the question of like what effect that's gonna have on future lifetime output. Uh, that, that may be challenging to work out. But yeah, but there is this interesting, um, um, yeah, in principle, alpha, I, that was one thing that appealed to us about the model, which is beta at some level is unknowable. Because if people are making ordinal comparisons without ever actually formulating numbers in their minds, they're not executing this process. They're doing something approximate about this process. But alpha and delta were very concrete. As in, in a domain like academic hiring, there's a delta and there's an alpha, and you can actually see them. And so that was one thing we, yeah, that we did find appealing with the model. I agree. Hey, um, so something that comes up in the hiring literature is about, uh, so here you've been assuming that the applicant pool is fixed. And so that can vary because it's sampling or maybe it's uh, drawing from sort of a different set of population, maybe for biased reasons. I was wondering if you could convert any of this or if you thought about um, using this to sort of assess pool health or pool potential at sort of going the other direction. Yeah, it's a good question. Right, so the sort of dynamic nature of the applicant pool. Um, our model is only can address that in a simple way for the following reason, which is the applicants are identical. And so pool health would be 
a unidimensional thing, which is just about alpha, because alpha is the only thing that controls that. Um, I think when we often think about pool health empirically in hiring, it's are the best people applying, or am I only getting weaker people to apply? But if you think about it, that actually is a richer model that says each person comes with possibly a slightly different distribution. So if I wanted to model that, I'd probably say, now my distributions are parameterized by something extra, and now what is that distribution of parameters of the people who are showing from the pool? Um, here, I think the, within this model, the most you could say is like, if we could grow alpha, we'd be, we'd be doing better. But yeah, yeah. so that, that'd be an interesting, interesting direction to think about. Sid, you had a question? talking about the equilibrium, the dynamic equilibrium, seems like if you enforce the Rooney rule, you are incentivizing people to try and create labels within groups which didn't have labels. So like the example that you gave where you had 80% of the people, right. there's a natural incentive now to try and oh, create I see, right. groups of yes. 40. Right, so you're okay. saying strategically in the 80-20 thing, we yeah. reserved a slot for the 20, yet there were these two arbitrary groups A and B within the 80, and we didn't reserve a slot for them. Um, yes, and of course, within the framework we have here, that's because they're all being treated equally. Um, I, well, I think what that's arguing is, <clears throat> if I introduce a policy that says we need to protect groups where there's bias, groups will be incentivized to argue that there's bias against them. And so within that 80%, a group might come along and say, here's the evidence that there's bias against us, so you should, um, yeah, that becomes, like, this is a sort of two-valued version of the Rooney Rule. One interesting question is, Suppose I am trying to hire for, you know, I have case slots to interview people. I have some potentially large collection of groups with different representations and different levels of bias. Now I, ha I have a new question, like, whom do I reserve a slot for and whom don't I, given that I have a limited number of slots I can? Yeah, and I think that, that becomes a very interesting kind of question. So I, I recognize that this may be a bit of a taboo question for a talk with so much theory in it, but in, in practice, uh, I guess, what does all of this lead you to believe the right kind of interventions are in terms of building more fair systems? Uh, so people have taken a lot of different um, takeaways from the first result you presented. Uh, and I'm curious if you think the right answer is to continue to try to build and understand the dynamics uh, or statics of models uh, like, like the Rooney Rule, um, you know, particular interventions, if you think there are specific interventions or if you think it kind of has to go beyond that level of um, thinking about it, you know, purely in terms of trying to find the, the absolute best uh, loss function, the absolute best thing to optimize for, the absolute best definition of fairness? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think, you know, I think one thing we learned from the first trade-off result, I would say, is that, you know, it's, you're going to have to look into the specifics of the domain, right? So given that fundamentally you're not going to get both of these kinds of um, uh, guarantees, um, you can argue in different domains, one of these may be more painful than the other, right? And so like in, in, the, in the original paper that we wrote about this, you know, we, we pick an extreme example, which is, you know, medical testing, right? Suppose there's a genetic disorder that's rare and more prevalent in, say, women than men, for example. So the base rates are unequal. But the base rates are unequal because of genetics. So you could either have a rule that's uncalibrated, that would mean you, or you could have a rule that has unequal averages. Um, which seems more reasonable. The unequal averages seem to follow directly from the fact that genetically these have different rates. The uncalibrated rule, which would somehow artificially equalize the false positive and false negatives, would mean you would, you would go to your doctor, they'd say, the test results came back, but because you're male, I've divided it down by five, because it's uncalibrated. In other words, the doctor would end up doing something calibrated, because, you know, medically that's what makes sense. So in, that's one extreme where you clearly don't want to equalize the averages. You clearly want to go with the calibrated rule. We can think about other cases where the social cost of being stigmatized is so high that you want to equalize. And so I think part of it is saying, you're on this continuum between them, you should look at different domains where I think the relative costs and benefits of enforcing these are going to be quite different. Um, and you know, so it, it at least sort of gives you some access along which, along which to think about that. Um, yeah, and from the later ones, you know, I think, um, as I said, you know, we sort of learned a bunch of things uh, from thinking about the Rooney Rule, in particular the fact that, you know, these parameters alpha and delta are somehow key to thinking about it, and, you know, the fact that since it so often gets applied in creative professions where the outcome is so heavy-tailed, uh, some of our intuitions about when to use it are not sort of a, a priori correct, and so I think that, you know, I think we found that useful also, definitely. Yeah. 
was. No? No question. Is there a Just putting the gaming hat, like let's say there was um, there was a policy that you know if this is the alpha beta data parameters and the rule uh, the Rooney rule would kick in or not. That's the policy of an organization. And then there's some individual from population X who looks at their value and says that okay, you know my estimated utility is going to be this. Should I motivate people from my group to apply so that the Rooney rule kicks in? And should I, or should I discourage them to apply so that the Rooney rule does not kick in, whichever maximizes my own utility? Yeah, I guess so one thing that helps is that the Rooney rule kicking in is monotone in the number who apply. So uh, at least that incentive points in the right direction, that if you get people from your group to apply, it's more likely that the group, that they would, because if only 1% of people from your group are applying, applying the Rooney rule is really draconian because Oh, that part, yeah, yeah, okay, that's true. So actually, okay, that part is an interesting optimization problem. Below a certain threshold, there is no Rooney rule, you're being hurt. Enough people apply, Rooney rule appears. That, that, that's a discontinuity, that helps you too much more. So yeah, so I see, so yeah, interesting point. You might want the minimum number so if the Rooney rule kicks in, that maximally benefits you. Interesting question. Yeah. All right. Thanks, thanks very much.